Yeah. And, and also know. something that doesn't get brought up is that historically people used to believe in universities. And I think we've lost that, especially young white men. If you would think of a Harvard, Yale, Princeton, or any of the and with good reason. Mul multitudinous, you know, secondary schools, you know, even colleges, people really believed in their colleges. They were members of alumni networks. Now I, I would hazard a guess that if you were to ask most white guys, regardless of the school, they will say, I'm there for a piece of paper. I'm not here because I believe in this institution. It's very cynical, the reason that they're there. So it's like, it, you know, no one believes in the institution anymore. And so, you know, they're kind of looking for ways to check out. And it's, they would leave if they could. They would leave if this wasn't sort of an academic shakedown for credentialism that you need to go there. Um, the spirit is gone. And you're not going to find that in non-white guys frankly and well, if i could add and and if that, i could also say oh, that, that that's a um that's the endemic problem which is that why people on our side let's just say the right broadly are against entryism is because they're convinced like in academia that the system is aligned against them and they've convinced themselves that any any negotiation or any employment within that system is strengthening it. And in their good conscience, they can't do that. And what I noticed with guys on our side, it's it's about values. It's about first principles. Like, I refuse to play this game because, you know, they, they it, they, it hates me, you know. And I don't think you get that from anywhere on the left, even if they don't like. Like, you'll see more anti-government leftists get excited about town council meetings than you will with like a trad right winger. And I think that's relevant. And, and this is where you'll get the Hanania type saying that left wingers care more. And to some extent, there's truth to that statement. However, this is why, again, the entryism thing gets beaten out so much is because you have to look at those institutions. No one believes in Harvard or Columbia or even their state school or where they're from, despite the fact that, you know, college football, I, I would argue is more patrician than the NFL, but that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. Because you have to look at like, well, Obama's dear colleague letter. Like you basically made, you know, the co your college years of rampant sexual fun, quote unquote, um, illegal. And we have extrajudicial means inside the university to basically label you as a rapist and you can't do anything about that. Fraternities, you know, the 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 actual networking white boy ethnic mafias that existed on these college campuses long before you know a lot of these ellis islanders came around that was also thoroughly destroyed under the obama administration so your your ways in your ways out then affirmative action of course throughout the last 60 years so like there's a good reason to say yeah i'm not really interested in, in entryism but then i kind of run into this weird heuristic or this paradox and again i'm aware that it's a fault in my model because every guy I talk to in these spheres who's anonymous or even a face lord, they're usually well put together, high middle class income or even upper class income, white people with a wife and kid or multiple children. And I get it. Exceptions to the rules prove the rule because not everyone's like that. And I see that all the time in my job because, again, I live in flyover country. I deal with rural, middle aged older white people who work in government and have for years that will never improve the situation in their town because, hey, we we like it how it is. Or, you know, we'd rather just keep the money for ourselves and not pay for, you know, a new fire station or whatever. Like there, there are certain grants that I can never close where I work because as long as that town clerk is alive, I can't close it because I know damn well she embezzled funds or whatever. And so... Really? Not, yeah. Without without doxing yourself, like, is there a, a templated explanation we can give for how something like that works? Sure. Um, I would tell people to just look up the process of under the Department of Housing and Urban Development for community block development grants, and just you can look that process up yourself. Um, and so you know that applies to towns, and it can be like six hundred to. $300,000 projects, depending on what you're doing. So, I mean, like, it's a lot of money, and you're trying to fix your municipality or whatever, and uh, whether it's to create new, you know, job opportunities or to revamp a wastewater treatment plant, there's all sorts of stuff you can do with it, but neither here nor there. It's... I also had a question, and this is, again, a very, yeah. very broad question. In your 
mind is there is this just a problem at every small town i we assume that it's it'd be worse in ghettos or low-income areas but can we imagine any town or rural area where there isn't some level of this corruption occurring i'm sure it's a little bit of everywhere but i can't speak for that that's why i'm generalizing but i mean for instance uh some other grants that i do where i work again i'm trying to be really broad because I work with such a rural, small town, flyover America, I kind of I made I made this joke today, and I and I, I use it all the time at this training that I do, is is that when you acquire this new equipment, whether it be a tractor or a road grader or a new fire truck, by these state statutes, I have to monitor this thing, unfortunately, and keep records of it that you guys have it and it's in the right place for X number of years. And because of that, it needs I need to be able to find it at the fire station or find it at your, you know, your your city building or whatever. I don't want to find it at your cousin's garage. I don't want to <laughs> go down to your cousin's property. I don't want to tag it. I don't want to get shot at. I don't want to return fire. That's a lot of paperwork. So please make sure it's at the proper location. That way, when we tag it, we photograph it. It's there. And I I. I kind of wrote an article about this for the Old Glory Club, and I just called it Frog Swanson because my life is kind of this very close to me being that like sort of quasi reactionary libertarian figure that they make fun of who works in local government that deals with like crazy small town rural stuff in part because it's always there's always a shred of truth in sitcoms. But it's just like, damn, it's really a lot closer to reality than I'd imagine yeah. where I'm at. They but didn't it, know what to do with that character because in a, in a way he was vindicated for his hatred of government because the entire show is about waste and idiocy everywhere. Yeah, there, there really, there really is. Um, but uh, to, to get maybe more on track here, I, I, as I look at what my job is and where I work at, I realize that this is a very unique power node. It's a very tiny, very local, regional power node. But it's a node that if you're someone that wants to do, quote unquote, white fortressing, or you want to get out of the boon, you know, get out, out, out of the cities and you want to take over a small town, you better be friends with the people that get the Gibbs or help you get the Gibbs. Well, I have a question now. So when you are in a room in a conference hall, at just like the one you're describing at the beginning, do you get the sense that there's more individuals like you in your age range? So if someone wanted to do what we just said, you know, it, do you get the sense that there's enough of people like you out there to make this, or do you just feel alone in that crowd? Hmm. Uh, I would definitely say I'm alone in that crowd. Cause there's no one that's my age. <laughs> they're all, they're all my, they're all, my, they're all gen Xers or they're all boomers or somewhere in between that age range. And, and again, this kind of reminds me of the, and I, again, I don't want to talk shit about people, but I'm reminded of that Walt Bismarck substack essay about like why he's not a white nationalist. Those are always great. Anytime you hear, uh, you, you get wind of someone like, here's why I'm not doing the thing I was doing before. I'm like, okay, this is you trying to apologize, but sound like you're smarter than everyone. It, whatever it is, it's always great. Yeah. And I mean, Again, I'm not the only stuff I've seen between him. I know he did a recent interview with Alex Kashuda or something. I haven't w w listened to it, but I, I know that him and Dave, the distributors, have kind of gone back and forth on some things. But outside of that, I don't I, I, I remember him most for his alt-right days. And so I, I, I kind of read it and he moved and he was in a less cosmopolitan, diverse area and things changed. And it was very funny for me to read that because I moved from a, you know, heavily non-white cosmopolitan area to rural majority white flyover america and i got more radicalized um and that's a weird thing to say out loud but it's because this will be on the air but it doesn't matter at this point because I've, I've told that story before but it's well, just it's important it's important because what they will say against you they'll try and levy against you is oh you believe this because you've had no exposure to that which you complain about but you can mm -hmm. say you absolutely have same with me like I, we lived in toronto for quite some time which is like a hub of multiculturalism up mm. here in canada like my entire life from the early childhood has been surrounded by 
you know, a, a multicultural milieu. So I'm like, it's not based on ignorance. And it's surprising how many people don't believe that. And I think you're, you're becoming more radicalized due to the context is more admirable than someone who changes their context and says, like they, they change their temperature and they forget what it's like to be, you know, hot or cold. It's like, oh, maybe that was just a dream I had. All that bad, all my beliefs. I was that was a weird dream. I I moved to a new place and I changed my entire fucking political orientation. Uh, just the, in case the uh, official blood Sally position on Walt Bismarck, he's a great big fucking fool. Anyway, let's go ahead. <laughs> We're gonna do, dwell on that. But what a sack of dumb shit he is. Anyway, I don't I don't want to dwell on this. I don't want to dwell on this. He's a fucking retard. I do not want to dwell on this. Let's keep going. Thanks, Dimes. Uh, you know, back, back, back to you there, buddy. But no, uh, you, well, you've heard Blood Satellite's position. I don't know the guy well hey, enough. Hey, well, to... well, Bismarck. I hope, I hope, uh, I hope you see a car accident, and uh, it makes you, um, it gives you bad dreams for years, and it makes you not want to ride in a car like Tom York from Radiohead. Anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about this. You know. All right, who's, moving on. Say, who, who moving, says moving this? on. Who, dimes, who, dimes, who, dimes, who dimes. says this? Shut, who says shut, it? shut, shut the fuck up. Thank you. So <laughs> back, back to the subject at hand. Good lord. And start calling you Nichols for how much you keep changing around here. Um, <laughs> so also again, for the folks on the name of my son, Nichols. Oh, uh, okay. Well, good to know. I can't That's wait. That's what we call them, dimes and nickels. Yeah, dimes and nickels, nickeled and dimed, chipped again, surrounded by pennies, too much bronze. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> see, this is why we get all the, the the crap out in the first hour. That way, the second hour behind the paywall is really good. I right, see. We see. This is just how the grift goes. Respect the yeah. grift. We, we we had a gentleman's agreement on a core that this would be dog shit for the free uh, half. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but uh to, so back onto this which is the for me at least looking at the small power node of government and there are a lot of small power nodes and even inside local government like your county commissioners are super important so like you have the your town your towns your township your 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 city or whatever and then you have the county that they're in so like if you live in What's a, an example I can use off the top of my head? So uh, let's say um, if you live in, say, the, the town of Amarillo, Texas, which is in the, the Texas panhandle, that is in Potter County. Your Potter County commissioners help determine what money gets spent in your county. And when grants are delivered to them uh, for the county of Potter County, they have to split it up based upon the districts. And it's kind of important to know who these people are and why they're running for office and that these people control parts of the purse strings. And that's really important for any aspect of government. And if you work with, say, a council of government, so sort of this multi-jurisdictional body that helps assist other counties or municipalities for grants or area um, agency on aging, et cetera, these triple A's, uh, ombudsman, etc. These are really small areas of power that people don't think are areas of power because these are people doing their day jobs, like grant administration or making sure that you know elderly white people in nursing homes aren't being abused or that their nursing home is sanitary or that regional transportation for uh, veterans or you know paratransit for disabled people is available. Believe it or not, those are areas of power. But no one considers them areas of power because it's not like, well, I'm controlling immigration policy. And don't get me wrong. Immigration policy is absolutely important. Um, you know, the entire like 200 miles south of the U.S.-Mexico border should be like turned to glass. And the Darien Gap needs a couple <laughs> of A-10 runs. But I'm just saying on a local level that I think there are things that the average Joe can achieve, especially if you live in like the suburbs or even in a smaller city. They're pretty accessible. These people have names and numbers and offices, and you can talk to them. And they're pretty open to hearing all sorts of crazy shit um, because they hear crazy shit from left wingers all the time. 
a voice of sanity would probably be a warm welcome for them because 90% yeah. of the time, depending on what you do, or if you represent an organization or a company, they have no idea who you are because no one tells them who they are.